So when I say we model my uh, our approach to the inverse with uh, to the inverse matrix, uh, we model it from our experience with numbers. Uh, that's what I mean by that. Uh, inverse. In order to address the question with the inverse, we're going to consider only square matrices, in general square matrix of size m, sorry, n times n. The question we'd like to address is this: how to find how to find a matrix, or whether we can find such a matrix, which will be also square of the same size. How to find a matrix such that if you multiply your a with this new matrix x, you will come up with the identity. If we can come up with such a matrix, we will call it the inverse. And we will even reserve this, the notation like this for that matrix. But you have to realize this is simply a notation, this one. This is simply a symbol which stands for this inverse defined like so. And again, you see, in general, because the product is non-commutative, we have to require both sides both side multiplication. Yeah. Finding inverse, even when you really master the, this, the algorithm of finding the inverse, it's not an easy task. It's very intensive, I mean, computation-wise, very intensive task. You have to practice a few times. The, you have, you will, in this topic, you have to do it by hand a few times, and you have to do it efficiently because it takes time. Even it, it, it takes time for, even from very experienced uh, student. Uh, but let's just discuss the strategy how we can do that. So I will I will I will show you a strategy by uh, on example. I'll take the size three times three matrix. That's actually uh, one of the examples from the lecture notes from page fourteen. I will take a matrix like so. It will be my matrix. I won't be actually doing any computations with these numbers right now. But just to give you some con concrete example, I just took this 3 times 3 matrix. And I'll take you through the steps which justify the method of finding the inverse. The method itself is just a computational method. But the steps which justify that method, they have a little bit more interest, I think. So we're looking for the inverse, x. It will be a, it will be matrix of the same size, n times n. So let, let me just take this unknown matrix and give the names to the entries of, of this matrix like this. In principle, in principle, if you look into this question from the point of view of from you from the point of view of your of your experience, you can argue like so. In principle, you have nine unknowns, isn't it? Your matrix is three times three, nine slots. You have to fill in with these unknown values. In principle, you can just take this matrix A, you can put it in here. Put your unknowns in here. Perform your matrix multiplication nine times. It will, I mean, you can take this dot product nine times, right? It will be dot product for the first entry of the product. It will be dot product for the second entry in this product. It will be dot product for all of the nine entries in this AX product. So altogether, you will have a, uh, nine dot products sitting in the right positions on the left-hand side. On the other side, you will have your identity which is 3 times 3, but you know the components of that identity. If you equate your left-hand side to the right-hand side, component by component, you will end up with 9 equations with 9 unknowns. Task is solved, isn't it? Yeah, but in, effectively, that's what you're going to do when you, when you will be for, for looking for the inverse. It's just we're going to put this in a more structural way so that actually solving this system of 9 equations with 9 unknowns... Uh, sort of looks easier, because when you have a structure, it's easier to find the mistakes, it's easier to remember how to do it, it's easier to actually perform the computations. But effectively, that's what we're going to do, that's what you're going to do. A few times. You will be solving these nine equations with nine unknowns. There will be shortcuts, there will be effective methods to do shortcuts, but in principle, that's what you're going to do. Now, let, you, let me show you one of the ways how to do it efficiently. Uh, we're going to treat this unknown matrix with unknown components as columns. So, I mean, we, we, I'm going to take the columns. I'm going to give names to these columns. These would be first column vector, second column vector, third column vector. If I treat my unknown matrix in this column fashion, 
is my matrix in a column fashion. First column, second column, third column. Let's just look now at the left hand side here. How we can look at this, at, at this left hand side from the column point of view. If I multiply my A by my unknown matrix X written as columns, question 11, we discussed it last week, tells us that the product, if we treat the product in a column fashion, it will be simply this product. So we multiply matrix A by the column matrix X1, and the result will be column vector, which, put, which we put in the first column of my product. We multiply matrix A by the column vector X2. That will be another column vector, which goes into the second position. And here's the third one. Now, right-hand side, that's the identity, identity of size 3. So right-hand side, here it is. If I treat my right-hand side as columns again, here's my standard basis vectors, E1, E2, E3. So if, now I, if I will equate now columns on the left-hand side to the columns on the right-hand side, here's my columns on the left-hand side, here's my columns on the right-hand side, I will end up with three vector equations. Here they are. Well, actually, that's, that's the equation, actually, of the columns on the left-hand side to the columns on the right-hand side. And here's my three vector equations. First, second, and third. Effectively, I didn't do much. Uh, in, I'm in comparison of my previous strategy, when I said we have nine equations with nine unknowns. This time, I just combine my equations in three groups. First column of equations, second column of equations, and third column of equations. So rather than having nine equations with nine unknowns, I have three vector equations with three vector unknowns. But the advantage of this approach is this. With vector equations, we know how to solve them in a structural way. We have the row echelon form method. We have Gaussian elimination method. So imagine now if I want to solve this one just by itself, what, what will you do in, in, in the general way? You will extra extract the augmented matrix of this matrix. Well, if you solve this one, you will extract the augmented matrix. If you solve this one, you will extract the augmented matrix of this matrix equation and then each of them you will take to the row echelon form now the shortcut now now comes a shortcut actually because even though you're looking at three well even even though you're looking at still you're looking at nine equations you have three equations here three equations here and three equations here the shortcut it now now is very clear because if i take this matrix to the row echelon form i will need some row operations the shortcut is here. We have the same left-hand side here, the same left-hand side here, and the same left-hand side here. So when I will take this matrix to the row echelon form, the same set of operations will work for this matrix. And the same set of operations will work for this matrix. That's significant advantage. Rather than doing row echelon forms on the matrix of nine rows, you will do it on the matrix on three rows only, and that will do for all of the three other, other two because you have identical metrics on the left-hand side. There will be something different on the right-hand side, but left-hand side will be totally identical. So in, in practice, when you're going to do that, you're going to combine all of these row echelon forms in one single, sorry, all of these augmented matrices in one single advanced or expanded uh, augmented matrix, like this, where you write all of the columns all of the right-hand side columns just here, and that will be ident identity matrix. Here we go. Here we go. And you will be taking to the row echelon form this large combined matrix like 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 this. Not only you will be doing that. In fact, if I take something to the row echelon form, that will give me the solution by a back substitution. We know that. We did this a few times. However, if you remember, if you take it not to the row echelon form but further to the reduced row echelon form. Not only you will be able to find the solutions via back substitution, in fact, solutions will be on the right-hand side. If you take this extra further step, 
which computation may be not as effective as just back substitution, but from a structural point of view, it's a good point. If you reducing your matrix not halfway, not to the reduced, uh, to, not to the row echelon form, but further to the reduced row echelon form, right hand side will have a solution right away. You don't have to do anything after that. And yeah, you won't be having anything after that. So what I'm saying is this: if you now Imagine you found a way to reduce your matrix to the reduced row echelon form. If you can do that, then applying these operations to this matrix will produce your reduced row echelon form on the left-hand side, and on the right-hand side will be matrix with columns which represent the solution to this system, this system, and this system. So effectively, that will be your X matrix. This is, a, this is a first approach to the strategy, how to find the inverse matrix. Even though probably you have some questions to the strategy. Uh, any, any questions, any objections, any comments? Well, how would, nobody want to ask me what happens, for instance, I mean, when we studied with you the way of solving system of linear equations, there were possibilities when the system wasn't solvable, for instance. There were such possibilities. What's going to happen in that case? What's going to happen if my A will be something which, if you reduce it to the row echelon form, the right-hand side here will be a leading column? The answer to this is this. In fact, it is not always true that inverse exists all the time. In fact, this, well, now I give it to you as a theorem, the inverse matrix exists if and only if the, this reduced row echelon form will have all leading columns in the matrix. So there won't be any leading columns here, here, or here. 